Hi, I'm David Corliss. I'm pleased to present this at SAS Global Forum. Today we'll be talking about the disproportional impact of COVID-19 on marginalized communities. Let's have a look at the topics to be covered. First, we're going to be looking at what we mean by disproportionate impact and different ways that it is seen. We'll review the study methodology, and then we'll get into the details of a time series analysis conducted at a county level across the United States. When the time series analysis is complete, we're going to look at other areas beyond COVID-19 direct cases and deaths that are also disproportionately impacting marginalized communities that are aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we'll give a summary and state the study's conclusions. So first, let's have a look at disproportionate impact. Here we're looking at CDC rate ratios by ethnicity. Uh, this is uh, current information as of March 6th, 2021. We see that when we look at cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, that there is a greater risk, uh, an increase in the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths compared to white persons for various ethnic groups. We see this in indigenous persons, American Indian or Alaska Native, not Hispanic, Black African American. We do not see an increase in the Asian population. However, there are some concerns about these particular data. Most importantly, that the data received by the Centers for Disease Control is very incomplete. Only 53% of case reports include race or ethnicity. And this leads to the possibility of not only incomplete data, but also reporting bias in the cases that are reported. In addition, this point in time data averages the time series. And because of this, it understates the intrinsic risk, which is most apparent at the very beginning of the pandemic. This happens because of politicization, which has been highly present in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. Political responses have created a group a degree of behavior driven morbidity and mortality. Factor driven more by behaviors than by intrinsic underlying risk. And it tends to mask the under this underlying risk. And so by looking at the entire pandemic, we lose somewhat the actual underlying risk by looking at the pandemic interval by interval gradually throughout the period as it evolves, we can understand both the intrinsic risk, which is seen at the very beginning of the pandemic, and then compared to that, we can see the risk associated with these political-driven behaviors that have been so present in the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's have a look at that in a little bit more detail, because time series methods are needed to get a full understanding of the phenomena of disproportionate impact. Let's start with a small case study. We're going to look at the Detroit metro area. There are a couple of reasons why we're looking at Detroit. It's one of the areas that was uh, impacted severely at first. Also, it's a very good place to look for a disproportionate impact among marginalized communities because it turns out that the metro Detroit area is very, very sharply divided, perhaps the most racially divided metro area in the country. Further, health department statistics, normally at the county level, yet they report the city of Detroit separately from the rest of the county in which it is included, Wayne County in Michigan. And so we can look at the city of Detroit with a very, very high BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, Person of Color percent of the population, compared to the remainder of Wayne County with, with, with a very small BIPOC population. This largely white set of suburbs in Western Wayne County, as well as the neighboring counties of Oakland and Macomb in Michigan, provide a, in, provide a case study of disproportionate impact. When we look at areas where there is a very, very small uh, number of persons of color, 
whether it in Western Wayne County or in Oakland and Macomb, we see very, very similar tracks. But these are all very, very different from what we see in the city of Detroit. We see a much, much, much higher risk. We are looking at deaths because deaths are almost certain to be recorded, whereas cases are very often missed uh, because in the case of this particular disease, COVID-19, uh, many cases are um, asymptomatic. Many more cases have very, very minor symptoms that don't involve contacting the health department. And so cases become a very poor way of tracking the pandemic. Instead, mortality, especially mortality per capita, is the best practice. Now, when we look at mortality per 100,000 residents, we can see how looking at one large area, the state of Michigan, masks what is happening at a more granular level. We compare the state of Michigan to its suburbs. There's a higher level in the suburbs. There's a much, much higher level of mortality in Detroit. And in the remainder of Michigan, the numbers are extremely low. And so we see that state levels, at least for most states, state level is far too large an area to be able to properly track the differences in this pandemic. When we look at the methodology, we measure the pandemic week by week, and we see a series of waves that have manifested themselves. We have an initial wave in the spring. It reaches a minimum on the downside of the wave around the end of June. We then see a slight increase in summer compared to the initial wave. But as we look more closely at that wave, we're going to find that this summer wave happens in some places and not others. And that's very informative as to the underlying nature of the pandemic. We then see a fall wave. The fall wave was long predicted by epidemiologists. It follows the same general trend that we see in other pandemics. Uh, and it was uh, had a very, very great impact. So we're going to be using this phrasing, the individual waves, and we're going to look at how they have played out and distinct behaviors in each time interval. So for best practices, we're going to be looking at deaths rather than cases because cases are often missed. We're going to be careful to adjust for population size Everything we'll be looking at is per capita metrics. In particular, we're going to be using deaths per million. We need to have county level data, something at a more uh, finely grained uh, data level that still has response data available. The New York Times has created a database from screen scraping county health department pages. This is actually the best source of case hospitalization and death data. Uh, and it's the mortality data that we're going to be using in this study. Now, some of this data gets reported to the CDC, some doesn't, there are variations in reporting. Sometimes that data is in part very complete. We saw that to be the case with race and ethnicity, which is at the center of this particular study. Looking at the New York Times data, at the county level, it's complete, it's current, and at a county level, it can be matched to Census Bureau demographics to give complete coverage. We're going to look to the first wave to show the intrinsic underlying risk apart from political influences. If we look very, very early in the pandemic, before there were widespread protests, objections, disregarding of safety protocols, we see that develop in the second wave. We see that as causative in the second wave. The first wave shows us the intrinsic risk to marginalized communities before that risk is blurred by politically driven risky behaviors. We're looking for the underlying intrinsic risk to marginalized communities. And so it gives us a key metric. Key metric in the study is going to be cumulative deaths per capita through the 25th week that's starting on January 1st, 25th week of the year, that is to say through June 27th. When we look at the first wave in detail, we can take all of the counties in the United States 
divide them into quintiles, 20% of all counties in each bin. They're going to be divided by the percentage of BIPOC within the population. So the states, the, the counties that have the largest percent population are in bin five, that have the smallest BIPOC are in bin one. And it stages up, and each bin has the same number of counties in it. Each has 20% of the total. When we look at mortality in biquintile in phase one, we see the highest mortality in counties that have the highest BIPOC percent of the population. We see the lowest mortality in the whitest counties on the left. And as we step through the deciles, each decile with a higher number of BIPOC, we get a higher mortality. This is in uh, early in the pandemic, before there were a lot of mass protests and so on, before a lot of politically driven behavior and disregard by some people rather than others, people making personal choices about behavior, some of which were very risky. Before that began to become very entrenched, we look early in the pandemic to see the intrinsic risk and here we see very clearly disproportionate impact between left and right in this plot, between those with the lowest percentage, those kind of lowest percentage of BIPOC and the highest. When we look at the summer wave, we see much of the same behavior. We do see a bit of an increase in the whitest counties in the country. What we're seeing here is politically driven behavior as we see places that believe that they have been the least affected have been disregarding uh, safety protocols. A lot of this driven by uh, political speeches and rallies and so on. This is not underlying intrinsic risk, but rather behaviorally driven risk. And we see an increase in the whitest counties in the summer wave. We also see the summer wave. It will happen in some places and not others. We'll look at that in more detail in just a moment. When we look at the fall wave, the numbers are, of course, much higher. This had been long predicted by epidemiologists looking at previous uh, pandemics. In this case, we see the highest levels in what were originally the least affected groups. This is where we have the highest disregard of safety precautions, and yet they fairly well balance out. We don't see a lot of differentiation in the third wave. And so in each distinct wave, we see different behaviors. It's only in the first that we can get the real risk that we're looking for. And then we see politically driven behavior, behaviorally driven risk in the subsequent waves. When we look at it month by month, we can do a comparison and get a better view of how politics have driven part of the evolution of the pandemic. We're going to look at month by month, and we're going to look at red states versus blue states. The distinction between red and blue here is made on the basis of the political party of the governor of the state, uh, because this determines not only the governor's office, but generally the state administration and the policies that were actually followed at a state level. Now, when we look at the first wave, we can see a much greater impact in poor urban centers. These are areas that much more often vote blue. And so we have predominantly blue states, or at least blue state administrations, in the first wave. This shows the real underlying distinction before there were political actions and political behaviors that drove risk. When we go to the summer wave, we see a very different picture. Here we see, beginning about the 1st of July, we see uh, red states having much, much higher rates. In fact, if you look at just the profile of the blue states, we see the initial peak, we see it drop, we see it level through the summer and increase in the fall. This is the pattern found around the world. This is especially a pattern found in countries most similar to the United States. Canada is probably the closest match to the U.S. in many ways. We're on the same land mass. We have a, a long border. Um, and in many different ways, uh, we're similar to what's happening in Canada. Canada and other developed nations did not get a summer wave. This is something that only happened in the U.S. 
and indeed only in red states. This shows that there's political behavior and behaviorally driven risk that changes the numbers in the middle range of the pandemic. When we go on to the third wave, we see a dramatic increase, as has been forecasted. We see similar impact to both red and blue states, although red is, remains a little higher. We do see that when the third wave begins to pass, we see that the drop-off was much faster in blue states. And so we also see, as we look across the entire pandemic, this changing behavior. Before there were behaviorally driven risks, but simply underlying intrinsic risks, we saw a much higher risk in blue states. We see in summer months uh, an, an extra wave that didn't happen in other countries, didn't happen in most blue states, predominantly happened in red states. And then in the fall, much greater increase all across the board, although when it began to drop off, red states were more affected. Now, when we look at other social pathologies impacted by COVID-19, it's not just the direct deaths that are a concern. We also see other problems, addiction, domestic violence, suicide, even human trafficking. There are many known social pathologies that disproportionately impact marginalized communities. We further find that a great many of these are uh, aggravated by COVID-19 pandemic. So here's how we can find out the degree to which this collateral damage, which still breaks along racial and ethnic lines, this is how we can manage it. First, we're going to develop a model algorithm that identifies the risk factors and creates a, a risk score pre-COVID. Knowing these risk factors, we can calculate, uh, we can identify those factors which were changed by the pandemic. The pandemic will change some factors, but not others. Having a complete set of risk factors, we find the subset changed by the pandemic. We find the changes in those scores for each geography in our study. We recalculate the model score so that we find the independent variables that are changed by the COVID pandemic. We rescore those, get new data for those, run it through the model algorithm again, gives a new score, then we can calculate before and after and see the percent change. Let's look at one concrete example. Human trafficking has a number of risk factors, but we find that only certain ones were changed by the pandemic. Some of the factors are historical. Some take a very, very long change or move glacially, such as regulatory environments. But we find some factors were dramatically changed just in the short time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Knowing which factors changed, we can get new data for these factors post-COVID, see what the new numbers are, run all the numbers through the uh, predictive algorithm that gives us a risk score, then compare before and after to get the change. And so in the case of human trafficking, we see that there is an impact of COVID-19 on human trafficking. This is something where uh, race is a factor. We know it's a risk factor. We know that as the pandemic has gotten worse, that difference by race and, is, and ethnicity has been aggravated. So it's a really good example of additional damage another area beyond direct illness from the disease where disproportionate impacts are also found. To summarize the time series then, we have three distinct waves of the pandemic. The initial from February through June, marginalized populations badly impacted and it teaches us the intrinsic risk. When we look at the summer wave, we see a behaviorally driven risk, a summer wave that only increases in red states. The fall wave is nationwide and indeed worldwide, expected by epidemiologists, and yet at the end of the wave, we found it lasts a little longer in red states, dropped faster in blue states. Looking at risk factors and comparing them to 
uh, other possibilities and uh, other concerns. Um, we find that uh, BIPOC has an odds ratio of 10.1 when we look at the areas of the country with the highest as the top two deciles, uh, uh, the top two quintiles, compared to the counties with the lowest percentages, less than 5%. So we're going to be looking at uh, the most prevalent, least prevalent, and we see an increase in risk of, uh, of the odds ratio is 10.1 for BIPOC, uh, prison populations, this was not done in the study, but it does have disproportional racial impact. And so we were able to pull that from another study. This is not something where we have Census Bureau data from where they were from originally or where they where they necessarily are. And so this was a better study that uh, gave us that. There is the uh, odds ratio is 5.5. Indigenous, we look at percent below poverty line. We look at the highest population data versus lowest population density, we see poverty, we see population density. These aren't racial ethnic characteristics. But when we look at other factors, we find that the presence of marginalized communities are much more impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic than other considerations, even after correcting for, yes, it's a city center, even after correcting for a higher poverty level we find that marginalized racial and ethnic populations are much, much more impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So here are the conclusions. Disproportional impacts on marginalized communities genuinely are seen. As the increase of BIPOC, we also see an increase in mortality. So step by step, we see a higher risk at all levels of corresponding to higher levels of mortality from COVID-19. Politically driven behaviors occur in the summer wave, and it appears to be a higher prevalence in politically driven behaviors, such as disregarding safety measures. We also find that in addition to direct illness and death from the disease, we also see connection with other social pathologies where disproportionate impact has long been known and that impact has been aggregated further by the COVID-19 pandemic. References. And thank you much for